Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Evans, and on behalf of the American Statistical Association, welcome to the Careers in Sports Analytics webinar. I'd like to begin by thanking the ASA for organizing and sponsoring this event. Uh, the ASA is the world's largest community of statisticians and is often known as the Big Tent for Statistics. I'd also like to thank Stephanie Kovalchik uh, at Tennis Australia and Dennis Locke of the Miami Dolphins for participating in this webinar. You'll be hearing from their personal stories uh, soon about how they became sports statisticians and how they use statistics in their respective sports. They'll also share insights regarding the evolving world of sports statistics. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you for your interest in statistics and sports. I think you'll enjoy listening to today's discussion. The availability of data and utilization of statistical methods in sports are growing rapidly. Uh, sports teams use statistical analyses to evaluate players and determine game strategies. Sports associations develop ranking and rating systems of players and teams. And sports analysts evaluate concepts such as streakiness and the hot hand. Professional athletes now use statistics to help them identify the strengths and weaknesses of their game so that they can direct their training and improve their performance. The evolution of the application of statistics to sports has created demand from professional and other or sports organizations for well-trained uh, statistical experts that can apply cutting-edge uh, statistical tools to analyze sports data. We have two such statistical experts joining us today, and I'd like to introduce them to you. Dr. Stephanie Kovalchik is the lead data scientist in the Game Insight Group at Tennis Australia, which is the governing body of tennis in Australia. And she's a research fellow in sports analytics at the Institute of Sports, Exercise, and Active Living at Victoria University. Her research focuses on the use of statistical methods to understand performance, game strategy, and mentality in high-performance tennis. She is also the creator of tennis analytics blog called On the Tee and regularly writes about tennis there and on Twitter at, at Stats on the Tee. Stephanie joins us from Australia where it must be quite early for her. Stephanie, could you please uh, say hello and tell us a little bit more about yourself and your main responsibilities at Tennis Australia? Sure. Hi, Scott. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so my role at uh, Tennis Australia, it's, it's primarily research. So, so in that sense, it's not um, that different than what a traditional statistician uh, would do at a university or other research institution. Um, I think what makes my role um, in sports unique is, are the different audiences um, for the for the research that I'm doing. So I think one uh, one area, one audience um, is you know the research community at large, so other statisticians, other sports scientists. Um, but I think in addition to that, um, there are a lot of projects that I'm working on that are intended for coaches or athletes, and those would involve. Um, questions more specific to game strategy or improving training or helping players to prevent injury, for example. Um, and also, um, there are a set of projects that I work on that are directed more towards fans and broadcasting, and there the goals are often to promote analytical thinking and tennis um, to a wider community. Um, so I think those are some, some of the general categories and ways in which um, a role in sports statistics can be unique. Great. Thank you. So we'll get more, more into some of those details in just a moment. Um, our second speaker is Dennis Locke, who is entering his third season with the Miami Dolphins and his second season uh, in his current role there as Director of Analytics after serving as the head analyst in 2014. In his role, he supports uh, football operations through statistical analysis and research. 
He's currently finishing his uh, doctoral degree from Iowa State University with a dissertation on utilizing statistics in sports. And while at Iowa State, he served as a consultant uh, for the Iowa State University men's basketball team. And Dennis comes from a family of statisticians and has published a prominent textbook uh, with several members of his family. Uh, it's called Statistics, Unlocking the Power of Data. Now, the Dolphins lost, lost a tusk one last week, and they, they, they have another tusk one. I know they're coming to New England this week. But, uh, Dennis, could you please say hello and tell us a little bit about yourself and your main roles with the Dolphins? Yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, and thanks for picking up last Sunday right before introducing me. Uh, great way to get things started. No, but I'm happy to be here. And I want to thank the ASA, and this is Statistics, for setting this up. And I also want to thank everyone out there for listening. In general, in terms of my role, I'm in charge of, you know, everything data, data analyses, analysts, and essentially data possibilities across football operations in the Miami Dolphins. I think you know, and my perspective would be a little bit different from Stephanie's in that everything I do is, you know, singularly focused on the Miami Dolphin and directly for the Miami Dolphin. Whereas Stephanie is a lot of research based and it sounds like she has a lot of different a uh, lot of different clients and fields out there with the work that she's doing. But you know, to go I'll uh, just speak broadly now, we'll get into some specifics as we go, but I kind of break up the main parts of my job into, you know, three equally crucial components. Uh, the work that we do for the player personnel, and so that I mean the work we do in scouting and the team building and the resource allocation aspect of uh, the NFL. And then we have the work we do with the uh, coaching and the game planning. So that examples of that are things like opponent evaluation, uh, self-evaluation, uh, game management. Uh, essentially, I want our coaches to have more and better information than the opposition every week. Um, and the third and final one, which is I think one of the big uh, futures of, of sports analytics and isn't as prevalent right now is the, uh, the sports performance and the practice planning and how are the players training. So examples there are things like injury prevention, peak performance, uh, training analyses, and just how can we get the most out of the players that are in our building. Great. Thank you. So we'll get more into uh, uh, the comments from both of you in just a moment. Um, I just want to just briefly outline some of the things we'll talk about uh, with both uh, Dennis and Stephanie today. Um, you've heard them talk a little bit about what they do, but um, uh, we'll have them talk a little bit about uh, how they got where they, where they uh, work today, um, what education and training they received uh, along the way, and so forth. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. One thing I will mention about uh, today's webinar, it is being recorded. Uh, it will be available for future viewing at uh, thisisstatistics.org. Um, and you can ask questions also to, to Stephanie and Dennis uh, via the chat section of the webinar. So um, I did want to make a couple of comments and uh, get some uh, uh, received some feedback from Stephanie and Dennis on the following. Uh, there's a real perception in sports statistics that it's about memorizing uh, batting averages of all your favorite players in the league and you become sort of a data warehouse of, of sports trivia. Uh, however, it's really important to note that being a sports statistician goes beyond trivia and also beyond basic statistical calculations of batting averages or yards per game or first serve percentages. Statistics is really the science of learning from data and measuring and controlling for and communicating how much uncertainty uh, there might be. And so statistics is really a foundation for how to think about problems and provides a, a sort of a compass for helping us make uh, better decisions. One definition of uh, might be is sports statistics is really a scientific discipline that yields powerful insights, provides a competitive advantage, and solves interesting problems. And I think there's a perception that statistics is all about analysis, but this could also involve uh, designing studies and collecting data and using adaptations to ever 
evolving data collection technologies. Uh, and then there's a great deal of critical thinking regarding how to use these data uh, from these studies to make better decisions that would improve player or team performance or maximize the probability of winning. Um, so I w was, would like to ask uh, Dennis and Stephanie, uh, you know, when you meet people, do you, do you, do you see that uh, and tell them that you're a sports statistician, so to speak? Uh, do they sort of perceive you as a uh, uh, a, a data warehouse, uh, uh, somebody who understands a lot of uh, statistics trivia, and how would you, how do you describe uh, to people, uh, in perhaps a more accurate way, uh, what you do? Stephanie, would you take a first stab at that? Sure, I'll get started. Um, I do think that that tendency is there. I mean, to sort of expect us to know records, um, you know, I have various facts and figures at, at the tip of our fingers. Um, and I think, I think there is some truth in that in the sense that I think we do have to, in our role, have familiarity with what data is out there. Um, perhaps, you know, we haven't memorized all of the figures, but I think we have to be, um, you know, savvy, knowledgeable about um, the different data sources that are there, I think, particularly now when so much data is available online and sort of disparate sources. I think often that can be of value to an organization, you know, as a sort of complement to what they might collect internally um, and understanding, you know, what is useful for addressing a given question and, and what isn't or what potential biases there might be um, in those data sources are all critical parts of um, of our roles. Um, and I think, um, you know, there's an opportunity um, when, when in a situation where we have to um, talk about, you know, our role with dealing with the data and what kind of define what our responsibilities are in the organization and what we imagine that should be, that um, I often see, you know, my role as being one that one provides a new perspective to an organization, at least in tennis, that largely um, doesn't have much statistical training among its current staff. Um, that that's something that that I bring that's unique, and um, and in doing that, I see a lot of my responsibility being um, to address some of the biases that are common. Um, well, and just you know the way um, every day. You know, some of the problems that we can get into when we think about probabilities and statistics, that it's not always intuitive. And so um, that can lead to um, perhaps, um, you know, biases in the way that we are understanding what's happening in, in performance in sports. So there are common ones that we come across. Um, and I see a lot of my, my role as being to try to reduce those tendencies. Oh, thank you. That's uh, that's. I, I agree that uh, much of the time, uh, trying to communicate with non-statisticians, particularly about biases, is uh, um, really uh, such a critical role for us. Dennis, how about uh, from your perspective? How would you describe? How do you describe uh, what you do, uh, particularly to those who sort of view you as a as a library of of a library of statistics. Yeah, I'd say probably on the, the bottom level, that's a large part of what I am is, is a library of statistics. You know, a lot of times there will be in meetings and you know, a scout will point to me and just say, how many sacks did Player X have last year? And it's kind of my responsibility to be ready with that kind of information at the drop of the hat. But that's the very base level of sports statistics. But I mean, the interesting thing is the sports statistics that you see in the media is primarily these base level statistics, right? The passing yards, how they did on third down, um, touch to passing touchdowns, even quarterback rating and things like that, they're a little more advanced, are just a, a pretty much a basic hindsight statistic. And with the media, well, as with the team where we go beyond where the media focuses on what the statistic is, the big thing is the why the statistic is. You know, that's what really matters. 
You know, if we did poorly on third down, you know, the media might report, you know, we were two for 13 on third down this past week. But it's not the what that's so important to us. And we have to identify that initially, but then it becomes into why. You know, why were we two for 13 on third down? And then how can we change that in the future to hopefully perform significantly better than two for 13 on third down? And so related to that is the whole predictive aspect of the future. So using statistics, using the hindsight to have foresight about what's going to happen in the future and trying to adjust that in any way that we can. And I think what's out there is really just the hindsight, just what happened, whereas what's truly important and what a sports statistician does, what my role is more is the foresight, is predicting what's going to happen next and determining ways that we can shift that in our favor. So do you do you um uh do you see the the media getting uh getting at it better at uh some of its use of statistics and understanding of uh statistics at that at that uh deeper level? I think the media is getting better at understanding the important hindsight statistics. But I think they'll kind of always going to be stuck in that hindsight mold just because that's truly what's interesting to the fans. And the fan isn't as interested in, and won't be. You really can't get into that level of what's going to happen next. What they care about is what just happened and what happened this past week. Right. So by design, the media will never become what, you know, truly a sports decision for a team does. Okay. So uh wanted to make a few comments about um, uh you see this slide here. This is a slide about uh, a symposium that is held every other year. It's called the New England uh, Symposium on Statistics and Sports, uh, known as Nessus. Um, it's run uh, here at Harvard uh, every other year. Uh, the next one will be in September of 2017. And uh, it's, a, it's a research symposium where people uh, um, submit uh, research that they've been working on on statistics and sports and uh, both Dennis and Stephanie have presented at this particular symposium and I thought I might mention it um, because it it's a good resource for uh, looking at um, uh, we, we, we videotape and, and collect uh, um, the slide sets from people who present their work there, and we put the videos uh, on the Nessus website. If you go to www.nessus.org, uh, there are videos from past symposia, and uh, you can view people presenting their research on statistics and sports there, and you could find uh, both Stephanie and Dennis there, certainly. Um, and I also wanted to mention that certainly there are many schools that are uh, – uh, organizing clubs and and groups that talk about sports statistics. Uh, Harvard has a has a new sports analytics uh, laboratory uh, that is organized by Mark Lickman. He's also the gentleman that uh, organizes Nessus with me, um, and the American Statistical Association, who's sponsoring this uh, this webinar and organizing this webinar has a section for on statistics and sports and um, for people who are interested you might be interested in joining the American Statistical Association and you could join that section and become part of a community of statisticians who work in, and are interested in this area and there are uh, student rates for joining the American Statistical Association they make it very affordable um, so if you're interested in that uh, there'll be more you could you could gather more information on uh, um, www.amstat.org. Um, so we yeah. talked a little bit about uh, what Dennis and Stephanie do, and maybe we maybe we can talk a little bit more about this in a, in a little bit more detail. Um, maybe we could have each of you sort of uh, describe some of the more interesting problems that you're working on and uh, why why are they important to the sport and important to your organizations um, in a little bit more detail. Um, 
Stephanie, would you like to lead off? Yeah, I think um, I'll mention three three current projects that I think um, are interesting in that they um, they each represent, I think, broader problems in in the sport where um, you know a, a large area of research can um, can be done. Um, so one of those is looking at how um, tennis players handle pressure. So um, one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in um, is the mental aspect of the game, which um, you know traditionally has been thought to be particularly crucial in tennis as being an individual sport and there being so much time that the players um, aren't actually actively in play. So during a, a professional tennis match, actually about 80% of the time is spent in between points. Um, so a lot of our interest is in, you know, how does the thinking and the processes, the routines that um, a player does um, in, in that period influence um, influence their performance. So, so one way that we're starting to look at that is by looking at kind of patterns um, in routines in between in between points, um, and specifically in um, that's involved developing a model for the time that players take to prepare for serve, and um, um, and that's nice because it's an event in the in a match that's um, almost entirely under the control of the server. Um, and so we can use that to sort of understand how an individual player, um, what kind of pattern they're using based on the, the duration of the preparation time. And we look at that from one point to the next. And in doing so, we can then look at uh, variation in that preparation time um, and develop a measure of consistency in those patterns. Um, and so I've actually been working on this um, with Jim Albert, who um, is a, a statistician at, at Bowling Green State and a former editor for JQAS, um, and has done a lot of work in baseball. Um, so I was able to recruit him for this kind of project. And uh, so we, developed a Bayesian model that would allow us to measure individual um, player-specific average times and consistency, which is essentially just the variation um, in their time to prepare. And that can give us insight into how players um, are influenced by different um, aspects of the game. So we can incorporate so the game context, for example, like what is the score and how does that influence the average time or the consistency in a, in a player's routine, which can give us more direct insight to the mental aspect of the game. Um, so that's, that's one area. Um, we're also interested in terms of an, in the course of play, how um, a player is responding to pressure um, in the actual um, active play. Um, and so that's involved developing um, sort of measures for bigger points in a match. Um, so you often will hear fans, commentators talk about big points or this idea of clutch performance. And so we've actually tried to quantify those moments. And in doing that, we can then um, look at how a player's performance varies under those um, higher pressure situations compared to ones that may be um, more typical or less important points. Um, and that can give new insight into how players respond to pressure. Um, and that's of particular interest for um, coaches um, because it can identify potential weaknesses um, that would be of more impact for the game outcome. So it would highlight you know, sort of aspects of a player's performance that would be particularly crucial to success um, and, and then potentially you know, could be um, 
could influence training decisions um, for for those players. And then the third one that I'll mention um, is sort of a general area of advanced metrics that could be, um, you know, used both for for research and understanding performance and the sport in general, but also as um, potential you know, product is for fans. Um, and so one that we're, we're developing is um, a shot difficulty measure. And this is of particular interest, um, I think, these days because it involves tracking data, uh, which um, we have more and more available now with systems like the Hawkeye technologies that underlie the player challenge system. So this um, is a multi-camera system that tracks the ball and player position um, essentially continuously throughout the course of the match. And now more of that's becoming available to, um, to, um, to our research group and, and others um, for having richer data to assess performance. And one of the things that we'd like to do with that is to um, actually look at the shot level and start to say what are shots that are more effective than others and develop metrics based on, on that. So, for example, you could start to think about errors in an entirely different way. We don't have to be constrained with this idea of unforced and forced errors. We can start to think of errors in relation to the difficulty of the shots that those errors occurred on. Um, so those are some of the things um, that we're hoping to advance. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Some of those quantities are so hard to, to quantify. Uh, working on methods to do that is important. I know that as a uh, when I've played uh, racket sports in particular or, or talked about them, uh, you get some players who play uh, who, who maybe don't play so well when they're ahead because they lose focus, and then there are players who don't play well from behind because they give up and and there's the people who don't play well when it's close because they get nervous. And uh, uh, it is a very, a very mental game in that sense. You, you have to get tough from sort of all angles. Um, there was a, some questions online about uh, what your blog was. Your blog is called On the T, right? That's and, right. So uh, there was um, another question <laughs> about um, where this, where the this uh, webinar would be available and it's it will be avail it is being recorded and will be available on this is statistics.org uh, all one word um, so Dennis maybe why don't we move over to you uh, you have a couple of uh, more in-depth stories you could tell us about projects you're working on yeah and one of my personal favorites is uh, resource allocation in the player procurement process so and how we're building our team or how we're getting the players in here and this one's fascinating because it's a level playing field because the, the NFL is a salary cap league, so everyone has the same amount of money to spend on players. Everyone has a comparable set of draft picks everyone, every year, so everyone has the same set of resources, and the team that utilizes those resources the best is the team that's most likely to win once the season gets going. Um, another one would be uh, prevention of soft tissue injuries um, while producing peak performance in our athletes, you know, with the NFL, once the season gets going, you know, the guys you got are the guys you got primarily. So at that point, what we want to do is get the most out of these guys. How can we, you know, what can we do to make them playing their best on Sunday? And what can we do to minimize any kind of injury risk, especially soft tissue injuries or the predictable injuries, to make sure we can have these guys on the field and make sure they're healthy and able to do, essentially do their jobs. And to go to the third one, I think probably the, the flashiest problem that I work on is uh, being involved in the game plan each week and just seeing, you know, the statistics we provide impact the team on the field and impact the strategy that we're going to use going against the opposition. Oh, that is exciting. Uh, I guess that was one question for both of you is how, uh, how interesting and exciting do you find your jobs? Uh, I don't know if you could maybe just comment on uh, – how much fun you <laughs> Yeah, do. I mean Yep, go ahead. It's great. I mean I love game day, I love draft day, I love the high intensity, high adrenaline, high anxiety, truthfully, moments of the year when, you know, just being in the stadium and just feeling the electricity and you know, looking out there watching the game and seeing, you know, some of 
my and our department ideas, you know, come to fruition out there on the field, and it's especially nice when they work. It's not quite as nice when the ideas don't work, but either way, it's, it's a lot of fun, and, and I thoroughly enjoy my job. Stephanie, how about yeah, you? Definitely, definitely share those, those sentiments. I mean, um, I think the two things I'm most passionate about, statistics and tennis, um, so it's really the perfect marriage, the, um, the role that I have now. I used to, um, you know, be working kind of in a more traditional role in, um, in, with health science applications. And, um, I was quite happy doing that, but I would spend, you know, my evenings and weekends, um, grabbing data from the web about, you know, tennis stats and looking into questions that I hadn't really seen tested in any way and, um, and you know, never really thinking that I could do this work full time. Um, so when um, this opportunity came along, it was um, kind of a no-brainer <laughs> to do it, even though it involved, you know, moving across the globe. Um, I was happy to do it because I knew I'd be um, so excited each day when I was um, working on the projects I would have available. Now, who are your main collaborators uh, for both of you? Uh, and, you know, do you interact a lot with, so Dennis, do you interact a lot with various members of the coaching staff? Uh, do you interact with players that much? Uh, Stephanie, uh, how about you? Yeah, so it's a combination, um, I think partly because of um, my role being split between a university and um, and um, an industry organization through Tennis Australia. So I think at Tennis Australia, I'm um, definitely, um, my, my office is shared by our performance team, which includes primarily coaches and trainers. Um, so, so they're going to be the main people I'm collaborating with um, there. Um, but I also am involved, you know, with more, more academic work and have colleagues at, at um, Victoria University and some of the other universities in the area um, that are addressing um, questions sometimes specific to tennis, sometimes just to sports science in general. Um, and one of the things that's nice about that is that I'm able to work with a lot of students, um, which I really didn't know was going to be a possibility until I had been in, in this role for some time. But actually, there's been a lot of opportunity to get students sort of from the undergrad level um, to a more advanced degree involved in projects. Um, and and that's, it's been a lot of fun to see um, kind of the ideas that they have and how um, being able to combine an interest in sport and an interest in analysis, um, how motivating that can be for them. Dennis, how about yourself? Yeah, so I'd say my number one collaborator is Tom Pasquale, the other statistician that we have on staff. He's the other half of the analytics department. And the two of us collaborate. I mean, it's all within the Dolphins. We really don't do, you know, Stephanie's doing a lot of things academic outside. We're not doing as much of that. But we're collaborating with pretty much everyone across football operations, you know, the GM, uh, executive vice president, you know, all the coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, the sports performance individuals, um, even as far as, like, the training staff and, and pretty much everyone that has data and that we can get our hands on and help them do what they do. I think it's so important for a statistician to be a good collaborator in many ways. Um, you know, uh, when you're collaborating with coaches and uh, players and, and people in front offices and so forth, uh, to they sort of help uh, make sure you you understand what the problem is and, um, uh, uh, you know, really understand the, the most important questions at a deeper level. Uh, um, that's, I, I, I think it's also, also important to make sure you understand uh, the questions before you, before you try to find out what the answers are. Um, so let uh, wanted to just maybe back up a little bit about the st 
statistics profession, um, the statistics profession is really a very promising profession, and uh, Google's chief economist, uh, Hal Varian, uh, said said about statistics. I keep I keep saying that the sexy job in the next ten years will be uh, will be statisticians. Um, when you look at the sports world, uh, are you finding uh, that uh, teams are hiring more? statisticians? Uh, uh, are they appreciating um, statistical analyses and, and uh, the, the kinds of questions that and kinds of answers that statistics can help you answer? Uh, are, they, are they learning to appreciate that more? What are your thoughts about that? Stephanie? Yeah, I think this one, you know, may may differ depending on whether we're talking about a team sport or an individual sport, just because often the, you know, the way that that, um, the the sort of league or equivalent is organized could look quite different. So, for example, in tennis, you have very kind of fractured organizational structure. Um, there's not like one centralized body that kind of owns all professional activity. It's split into these different groups. So I think the um, the opportunity is a bit more difficult to assess there because each organization can kind of go its own direction. Um, but I think from, you know, the conversations that I've had, from, from being in the role that I am, I do think that there's an a sense of excitement about a lot of possibilities. So I think um, all of the sports probably benefit from, um, you know, the uh, the success that's perceived in sports like baseball with what um, analytics has been able to do. And um, so, I mean, you often hear people throwing around money ball as kind of like a general term um, to refer to some idea about, you know, statistics. Um, having the potential to make huge impacts in sport. Um, so I think um, that has raised a general sense of um, awareness. And um, and in some organizations, like I think for tennis, which has generally been kind of seen as being in like the dark ages in, of statistical analysis, there's even a sort of sense of urgency of really growing in that area um, to help with, uh, you know, competitive advantage. So. Um, so I think right now the absolute numbers are probably small, but I do think that the growth is um, is high. Okay, great. Yeah, no, I uh, I would agree. Uh, Dennis, what are your what's your perspective? Yeah, so I kind of got a little story that could kind of paint what I think a good picture is. So so I graduated from undergrad in 2008. I just completed a project on evaluating NHL players with an adjusted plus-minus system with uh, Dr. Michael Shuckers, who at the time he had a work for the NHL, but now he's actually one of the leaders in advanced NHL statistics. But anyway, I presented this project in multiple places, eventually got to present to an assistant head coach for an NHL team, and then present to the GM that fall, in the fall of 2008. At that time, this individual and most of the league had really never even heard of or considered analytics or statistics as a way to improve their process. So, you know, that really didn't work out. So I decided to go back to grad school, learn more about statistics, you know, improve my resume, all that. Then in 2013, so just five years later, when I started speaking with teams again, most either had some form of analytics presence or were currently searching to start one. So it went from not really knowing what analytics was to most teams having analytics going on in only five years. And now, I mean, the NHL partnered with SAP making advanced stats publicly available to everyone. And he holds terms like Fenwick and Corsi, which are statistics based on shot attempts, regularly during an NHL broadcast. So I mean, eight years ago, no one thought about analytics at all within the NHL. Three years ago, most of the teams had started doing it or at least thinking about starting to do it and now pretty much all teams are doing it. It's gotten so far the media is doing it, and the casual fan is now starting to look at advanced statistics in the NHL. So I think the boom we've seen in the last decade in the non-baseball North American sports, so in the NHL, NFL, and, and uh, basketball actually being ahead of the other two, has been pretty incredible. 
And, I mean, I know multiple NBA teams that are looking right now for individuals to hire. Uh, we're going to probably be looking at the end of this season for an individual to hire. So I think it's booming. It's boomed and it's still booming. Yeah, growing market. I agree. Um, one question that came in for you, uh, Dennis. Uh, uh, how much of a say does uh, your analytics group have in, in personnel decisions? So I, I wouldn't call it a say. I mean, what we're doing is we're providing information for the decision makers. So like me personally, I don't have much of a say in anything. I'm just providing as much information as I can to the people that do have a say so that they can do their job to the best of their ability. So I will say that I know a lot of our information is being utilized when the eventual decision is being made, but I wouldn't say that it's me having a say. I would say that it's the information getting to the people that then have a say. Yeah, so they can make more informed decisions. Exactly. Yeah. And there was one other uh, another question that came in for both of you. Uh, Regarding when you're discussing your findings uh, with uh, with decision makers and uh, and your collaborators, how much granularity do you go into? Sort of realizing they uh, may not know uh, uh, high level statistics, uh, or at least to the level that, that of your understanding. Is that yeah, is that communication difficult? It, it, it can be, and I think the ability to make that communication is just as important as the ability of the statistical analysis. And sometimes it can be quite a bit more difficult. But essentially, even if you do the perfect ideal statistical analysis, if you can't then explain that analysis to a decision maker in a way that he can understand it, it's not a very good analysis. Okay. Stephanie, how about you? Uh, Challenges describing uh, the results of your work? Yeah, I think um, I agree with, with Dennis that effective communication of our work is, is really an essential part of what we do. Um, it can't have an impact if, um, if our, our team or collaborators aren't able to understand um, what we've done or what the implications are of the results. Um, and that can be challenging because there is such a diverse um, range of disciplines in the, the teams that we work with. And also sometimes some resistance to change, um, which when you are in an area that is growing so rapidly, you know, often you do feel like kind of the new kid on the block and, and there can be, you know, challenges in, in that role as well. Um, so I think, um, I think being conscientious of of the audience, and that often for me, reminding myself that the person that I may be communicating to may be in more of a decision-making role than than I ever really am. I'm usually, you know, the information provider, um, as Dennis was describing. Um, but often, the people I'm providing that information to, they do have to make decisions and on a daily basis, and so their their perspective is often you know, like, what what does this mean in terms of any action that I need to take, um, and I think, you know, kind of being able to put yourself in that perspective um, can help you to see, you know, maybe what what's the key message here, and then thinking of how can that key message be explained in plain terms, and I think it is, it does make sense that if you're finding yourself that it's difficult to find a sort of plain language message that you should rethink, you know, why is that the case? Because it may suggest something about the analysis that should be um, revised or potentially improved. Yeah, it's certainly a very valuable skill to learn as a statistician is being able to explain things in sort of non-technical language. Uh, um, that's extremely valuable, particularly, uh, and if, if, if you can't do that, uh, you know, people don't utilize your work as much, and so that it becomes sort of part of the part of the process to be able to learn how to do that. Uh, so very important, I think. Um, so uh, thought we'd uh, 
just sort of highlight uh, the breadth of uh, sort of statistics profession in general. Uh, on the screen, you see uh, covers of Chance Magazine. Uh, Chance is a is a publication of the American Statistical Association and publishes uh, articles about uh, various types of topics. And you can see some special issues there, everything from ecology and forensic statistics, and there's a special issue on sports there uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, one of the latest one is the has Zika virus uh, article on the front. Um, but, you know, statistics is really applied uh, in many different settings. Um, uh, they apply statistical thinking and methods to a variety of sort of scientific, social, and business endeavors. Um, everything from astronomy and biology, education, economics, engineering, genetics, and so forth. And uh, there was a there's a well-known statistician, uh, John Tukey, who was a quote that he is often cited is that uh, the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard, and certainly the the fun world of sports is is one of those. Um, so, uh, Dennis, you talked a little bit about how you, how you got here, how you got to where you got. Um, some might have questions about what education and skills are needed to become a sports statistician. You know, for for example, do you need a PhD or a master's degree or a bachelor's degree? And uh, what are what are employers uh, looking for? Um, so maybe we could talk about, uh, maybe remind us how you got to where you got, and uh, as you look going forward, um, or and we're advising uh, a younger person uh, who was interested in, in a job like the ones that you have, um, what would you advise them in terms of their education? And um, Dennis, could we start with you this time? Yeah, sure. So, so I... I think I might be a little bit of an anomaly as a statistician working with a team that at least will have his PhD in statistics. Don't quite have it yet, but hopefully soon. I think um, most most of the analytics people out there working with teams are master's degrees, or they even met several bachelor's degrees. And you see a see a wide variety of fields from economics, uh, statistics, uh, computer science is a big one right now. We also see the predictive analytics and other things like that that are kind of, you know, sisters of statistics or specific branches of statistics. Um, in terms of advice that I would give, um, I would advise even if you're not being a computer science minor or major, taking a few computer science courses because there's a lot of parts of well, my job where I feel more like a computer scientist than a statistician. And I know for the individual that we're going to be looking for next, we're going to be looking for someone who's actually more computer science than statistics. We want someone who actually has a combination of both. And I would also advise people to take advantage of the opportunities they have at the university or if in high school, at the high school level, and see if you can do some kind of statistical analyses for a team at that university or school, you know, just offer to be a volunteer and try to look at, help them look at what they're doing in a unique way and just get some experience communicating, you know, some type of statistical finding with a coach or um, a peer who doesn't have statistical experience. Okay. Stephanie, your thoughts? Yeah, I think that there are opportunities, um, you know, at any degree level and and I think there isn't any one, you know, particular path to getting into a role as a sports statistician. But I think some, you know, are going to make those options more readily available than others. So I think, um, you know, the more advanced you have in a statistically related field, um, the more options that you will have. Um, but I don't think, you know, that, that, that it's necessary, it is possible to demonstrate um, a skill and interest in sport um, and the, you know, statistical skills for addressing problems with data and analysis um, in other ways. But it just, 
requires a bit more uh, initiative. Um, so there's a long tradition, you know, of of people that um, have gotten degrees in in other areas or maybe not at all, but through blogging and writing on their own have demonstrated, um, you know, a unique way of looking quantitatively at problems in sport that have helped to get them, um, you know, important roles um, in with leagues um, or other sports organizations. I just think that's probably um, a harder path just because it requires a lot of self-initiative and time outside of what your primary work may be. Um, but in terms of the, the skill set, I mean, I think um, in addition to computing, which I agree with Dennis, is, is more and more essential these days. I think also um, there's a lot of interest in um, having people that are experienced not only in statistical modeling approaches, but also machine learning. So I think that's there's kind of more and more um, organizations looking for people with skills in, um, in those methods as well. Um, but I think um, definitely demonstrating an interest in sport um, through some means um, is going to, you know, set you apart from other people that may um, be competing for the same role you're interested in. So whether that's through, um, you know, an internship with an organization at an early stage or through presentations at places like Nessie, um, I think um, making some, um, showing an interest in, in the sport and knowledge of, of the subject matter um, is, is going to be um, a big help in, in getting a role like this. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, a, a couple of comments. Uh, I, I think that many people who have uh, sort of sports statistics jobs now, that, that there's lots of examples of people who have bachelor's degrees, uh, maybe a few with master's and PhDs, but um, uh, so certainly there are there are people out there with bachelor's degrees uh, in many of these positions. I do think that as time goes along, uh, that such positions are going to get uh, more competitive and uh, and and more advanced as the as the field evolves and and uh, in the future could require uh, some of the more higher degrees. You know, going after master's degrees and and doctoral degrees and. Uh, you know, certainly uh, in other disciplines, for example, you know, even in education, if you were applying for a, a statistical, uh, a statistics professor position, then most most colleges and universities would require a, a doctoral degree. And um, the sports world may not be quite there yet, but uh, uh, as time goes by and they they continue to. Uh, appreciate uh, what statistics might be able to help them with. And, and as more and more people get interested, uh, I think from a competitive standpoint, uh, uh, the advanced degrees will be more helpful. Um, and in terms of uh, classes, uh, certainly any statistics that you can take is, is helpful. There's a lot of uh, emerging data science programs out there uh, that will involve some of the computing courses that have been mentioned. Uh, and logic and mathematics, uh, um, and of course, learning about uh, you know the sports that you're interested in, uh, and interacting. I think taking opportunities to interact with with people like Dennis and Stephanie, whether it's at a, a conference like Nessus or or through the ASA and and uh, the section on statistics and sports, uh, and uh, and there are other mechanisms. Uh, I think that would be. You know, you you're going to learn a lot from from uh, people like that and those types of interactions. Um, let's see, so um, we've talked a, a few questions. I know we're coming up on the end of the hour. I did want to, if you do have other questions, uh, you can send in. Uh, we had one question here about. Uh, um, what programming languages do you use, uh, and what is the best place to find open positions for sports statisticians? 
Uh, either of you have thoughts about that? Yeah, so I use R and SQL, and I think one of the universal data management languages you'll find across sports teams is SQL. So I think that's one that would be very valuable to get at least a basic level of experience with. I know we're always looking, we look at individuals who are trying to make sure they have some SQL experience. And I think if you have experience with, you know, really any of the, the major statistical software, statistical, pro, statistical programming languages, you know, that's great. I mean, R, I think, is the best because it's open source, so it doesn't cost you anything, and you can do kind of whatever you want. But as long as you have experience in one of them, I think that's, that's adequate. And in terms of best place to find open positions, um, I would recommend attending the MIT Sloan Sports Conference. Um, there's usually a lot of a job board with a lot of open positions listed there, and you can also submit your resume to the resume book. I know that's one of the first places we'll look when we're looking to contact um, potential employees. Okay. Stephanie, any thoughts? Yeah, I just um, I, I would agree in terms of the the programming languages. I think R or an equivalent um, is. Um, is, is definitely a, a skill to have, and um, and also um, SQL I mean, for for day to day management. That is also what our organization um, primarily uses. Uh, we also have people that are working in in MATLAB, um, so so that's something as well. And I think you know proficiency in MATLAB or R that you know you can easily pick up one or the other if you're proficient in one. Um, I think um, in terms of careers, I mean, in addition to Sloan, I think uh, really any any of the sports-specific conferences. So I think in addition to um, NASI, which is actually where I found out about this job at Tennis Australia, so I have to thank Scott for organizing that one. Um, I think there are also some international events. So if you are um, able to travel overseas, um, there are events like Mass Sport International, um, which is a great way to interact with sports statisticians that are doing work primarily in, in sports that may be more popular in Europe, like soccer, cricket. Um, so if you have an interest in some of those or think you might, that's a great place to show your work. And those tend to be smaller events than something like Sloan, which has the advantage that it is um, easy to really meet every everyone that's there, all of the speakers, and that's a great way to find out about opportunities that may not necessarily be advertised. Okay. All right. So I see we're. Uh sort of up against the uh, end of the hour here, and so we'll think about wrapping up. I did want to remind people that um, this webinar uh, will be archived at uh, thisisstatistics.org, and we'll be able to be accessed there. Um, there are also information there about uh, uh, careers in statistics, and. Um, and you may find uh, there's also more information about careers in statistics at uh, uh, www.amstat.org, uh, maintained by the ASA. Um, maybe I'll just finish up. Uh, uh, any final thoughts uh, from Dennis or Stephanie? I did want to thank you for your time today. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting discussion. I know that uh, there will be lots more questions uh, as time goes by. Um, but... Uh, any any sort of closing thoughts from from you? I would just say whether or not you know you want a job in sports statistics, I think statistics is a fantastic field because it can be applied to really any field. So anything you want to work in, if you get a degree in statistics, you can probably find a job in that field. Well said. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Stephanie, how about you? Yeah, I just want to, to thank um, the organizers of this event and for everyone attending and, and Scott for moderating and um, and just to say that, you know, if you're really passionate about, about statistics and sports statistics that, you know, you should just get started today. I think there are a lot of questions out there that, that you know, you can answer with, with data that's available 
um, you know, publicly. Um, and so I think that's really the best way to see if it is kind of the right fit for you and also to go ahead and start getting involved with the community out there. Well, thank you. So uh, again, I wanted to thank uh, Stephanie and Dennis for uh, for the valuable time today and, and all of their advice and uh, telling us their personal stories and, and their thoughts about the future of statistics and sports. I uh, also want to thank the, the ASA for organizing the event and uh, for all the attendees. I know there were some questions out there we didn't get to, but uh, um, there's lots of different uh, uh, avenues by which uh, we can continue some of these conversations, uh, certainly via email. And, um, you know, the ASA uh, has mechanisms for discussions on uh, statistics and sports, if you if you join the ASA and become a member of the statistics and sports section, and um, and maybe get to see uh, some of you at uh, some of these symposiums like uh, Nessus uh, next year. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to uh, close the webinar and th again thank you to everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This is the from the American Statistical Association. I'm going to end and shut down the webinar now. Again, thank you for attending. I hope you have a wonderful evening. And for actually for Stephanie, I hope you have a wonderful day. I know you're just starting out. So we'll shut down. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.